Hi, Nicole. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, to The Beat. We're tracking breaking news about the Supreme Court. Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer will retire, teeing up one of the most significant decisions of this young Biden presidency. Here's how this big news broke today, with Biden stressing he will also respect Breyer's timeline for any official announcement. We're coming on the air with breaking news. NBC News has learned that Stephen G. Breyer will step down as a justice on the U.S. Supreme Court. There has been no announcement from Justice Breyer. Let him make whatever statement he's going to make. And I'll be happy to talk about it later. The president there is saying he won't talk specifics yet. That's a matter of both respect and decorum. But news this big waits for no one. The U.S. Senate already gearing up for a major confirmation clash going into the midterms. A senator with a vote on the matter joins our special coverage later on tonight's show. And White House staff already outlining some of the likely plans. Breyer now expected to announce his retirement as early as tomorrow officially. Reports are he would leave at the end of this term, giving the White House plenty of time to select and push a nominee. Now, is that Breyer's way of also shaping the timing of his own replacement process? Well, I actually asked him about how justices consider their own replacements. This was in a rare interview in the pandemic era on Zoom about two years back. He touched on some of the pressures here. Do you think the justices... Um, do or should uh, think about who will replace them and their retirement process while they are on the court? Of course, from, from time to time, you think about it. Uh, it's part of the aging process, and it's inevitable. Uh, now, you have to, what you say, I mean, we stay out of politics. And really, sometimes it's very hard to just stay out. But the more the political fray is, uh, hot and intense and so forth, the more it's, we stay out of it. Just a little insight now, he might think about it recently, and it's about to be plenty hot for Biden's first lifetime nomination to the high court. Senate leader Schumer now vowing a vote with deliberate speed. For reference, the most recent appointee to the high court took about under a month, just 27 days to go from a Trump nomination to confirmation. Now, as for the court's direction, Going from a Clinton appointee back in the day to a new Biden appointee would not be an automatic swim, swing, I should say, swing in the composition of the court. That's a contrast to what we know about what can happen with replacements. Take, for example, when Trump replaced a Clinton pick, Justice Ginsburg, which moved the court immediately to the right. But here's the other thing. Biden 2022 could still be a long ways from Clinton 1994. Biden has this liberal Democratic Party coalition. That's really a long way from what Clinton was doing with a centrist party in the 90s. And then you have recent history. Republicans have used raw power to shape this high court, with the McConnell-Trump axes getting three lifetime justices onto the court in one term. So many liberals want Biden to promote a visionary progressive jurist right now, a Scalia for the left, who might impact the court even in dissents on what so many view as the moral and existential challenges for America on defending democracy, on civil rights, on the government's legal authority to combat pandemics or climate change with the same powers that it can deploy on behalf of, say, the Pentagon or Wall Street. Now, Biden has not detailed a legal profile for his pick, but this is a court where 95% of all justices have been white men across history. And Biden already made news on that front as a candidate when he vowed to put, if elected, the first black woman on the court. We talked about the Supreme Court. I'm looking forward to making sure there's a black woman on the Supreme Court to make sure we, in fact, get every representation. Not a joke. Not a joke. I pushed very hard for that. Now, you could see when he made that news in February on that big stage, there were a lot of other candidates. It was at a time when he was not necessarily the presumptive nominee. Well, today, he's the president. And you think about how much things change in Washington. A few days ago, there was a lot of other different stories that were news. Now, this is the biggest thing facing Washington, the White House, the Senate. And today, I can tell you, as we report on all this, the Biden White House staff have reiterated the value just heard. In our special coverage night, we'll have a little bit more on the list of candidates. That's later on. Now, this kind of diversity pledge is unprecedented. But again, 
It's for a court that remains one of the powerful institutions that has diversified the least and the slowest compared to, say, Congress. And speaking of Congress, this whole clash will be headed right to the Senate, where Republican Leader McConnell has already previously changed the rules that allow four majority votes on these kind of Supreme Court picks. A reminder that filibuster can be tweaked and a change that may now help Biden. And the Senate's not a place for compromise. We know that. When Biden was vice president, that administration's first pick, Sonia Sotomayor, got 65 votes. Few expect that level of bipartisanship here, no matter who Biden picks. President Obama later learned the hard way that tailoring a pick for Republicans doesn't even mean they'll give you a hearing, let alone any votes. Now Biden is the president. And he mused last week, he said he was still surprised by how obstructionist McConnell has been. And it's Biden who must decide how to get ironclad commitments from every single senator in his own party with no room to lose a single vote. And that's where you might say, OK, Ari, are we talking about the law? Are we talking about Senate politics? Yeah, we're talking about the reality of the politics that shape who decides the law. So I'm going to tell you straight up, this is a story that broke today. We've all been running around making sense of it. Here's the deal. Joe Biden cannot afford a sequel of the opaque, delayed process where Senators Cinema and Manchin basically moved the ball on the goalposts or slowed it down when it was a fight about spending. He cannot afford a backup plan or a strategy where he just hopes that some handful of Senate Republicans might make up for any Democratic votes that he loses, either of the names I mentioned, when we're heading into the political fire of the midterms. And what's interesting here is who is in charge of this process right now? Because first in the Democratic Party and then writ large, during this pandemic at this tough times and coming through the Trump era, Americans, they went with someone with a lot of experience, which isn't always popular in politics, but across 50 years in government, Joe Biden has lived through this court process from his youngest days as a senator. Do you know his first ever vote for a Supreme Court nominee? It was all the way back, we checked, in 1975 for John Paul Stevens. And that vote was 98 to 0. Boy, times have changed. You know, they say to win a majority on the nine-seat Supreme Court, you have to count to five. Well, when Biden entered the Senate for confirmations, people were counting to 95 or 90 out of 100. I mentioned Scalia, who was what the right wanted. Antonin Scalia was confirmed 98 to 0 in the 80s. Unanimous, including Biden and every other senator. But now, tonight, I can tell you, Joe Biden faces a Senate with a Republican Party that opposes virtually everything and anything he does. And if he does something that they said they supported, now they might just reverse themselves, too. Biden's got to count to 50. As a matter of math, this will not be about appeasing Republicans, even those who might claim to have an open mind on these issues. And this won't be about debating Mitch McConnell on substance. It will be about leading his party and any wayward Democrats to 50. That's it. To paraphrase Jermaine Lamar Cole's teaching about learning and math, Republicans was all on the path. Now look at them pitiful. And all of a sudden, I'm so good at math. Count it up, count it up. Count it, 50. Count it up, count it up, count it. Welcome back to The Beat. We are in the midst of our special breaking coverage. And I can tell you, this is one of those days where you get the phone call. You try to, in our case, learn the story, get in front of a camera. Oh, my gosh, he's retiring. And we've been kind of dealing with that. But at the same time, I'll tell you, our producers and journalists here on The Beat have been wanting to take a few hours today with the little time we had to present to you what we know about Justice Breyer. We heard Senator Hirono just say that she thanks him for a quarter century of work. And I want to turn now to something we put together for you on Justice Breyer's actual legacy, the substance, and also what it shows about the future and the decision facing President Biden, as well as where the high court heads. So let me start with where we're going. The Supreme Court's shift to the right is actually evident when you go across Breyer's career, because in 94, he was widely considered a moderate pick at the time acceptable to conservative Republicans. Now, keep that in mind, because in the days ahead, as we talk about replacing him, you might hear, you might hear people on the right saying that Breyer's too liberal or they don't want someone as, quote, liberal as him. But facts do matter. It was a long-serving 
Utah Republican and Judiciary Chairman, Senator Hatch, who personally recommended Breyer to President Clinton as the kind of left of center jurist that Hatch could back. It was also a shift that Republicans wanted, because if you're wondering, well, why were they brainstorming people for Clinton that might work? Well, they were actually coming off the confirmation of an even more liberal judge who had just successfully made it onto the court, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Breyer came close to being selected last year and even came to Washington for an interview. But aides said he didn't click with the president, who turned instead to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. One big advantage for Breyer, he is very well liked in the Senate. That proved to be true. He was well liked and respected. I walked through just some of those numbers over the years of when the very partisan Senate still was not so partisan that they couldn't put forward qualified nominees onto the court. He was confirmed 87 to 9. Then Senator Biden was in charge of those hearings. Today, the Senate Judiciary Committee welcomed Judge Stephen Breyer, the president's nominee to be Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. In each of the uh, confirmation hearings that I've had the privilege to chair, I've tried to look at the broader issues at stake when we confirm a nominee to the court to consider the values by which our nation defines and redefines itself over time and the means by which government can best express and defend those values. So we welcome you to, here today, Judge, not merely to measure your competence to sit on the court, but to engage us in a discussion of those important matters. You know, you put the politics aside. History is pretty interesting. You look at those two individuals, their impact on so many things in America, and here they are at purposes again, this time Breyer giving a heads up, apparently, to the world so that President Biden might pick his replacement. Now, all of this, as mentioned, has gotten hotter and hotter as the Washington politics have changed. And when I did get to talk to Justice Breyer as a reporter, I asked him about how you deal with those politically pointed questions from senators in the confirmation process. The senators are going to reflect what you want. So you better stop it. And the way you stop it is when you disagree with somebody, you talk to them about it. You talk to them about it. You try to convince them. You participate. You vote. And uh, you do it yourself. An almost old-fashioned idea of how to deal with senators. That was in one of the interviews I mentioned, Breyer talking about the questions. Now, he would ultimately find himself ruling on some of the most important and pressing controversies in America. It was Breyer who wrote the majority ruling upholding Obamacare, which was challenged several times. This was a series of rulings that continued to reinforce Obama's signature health care law. Today's decision was a victory for people all over this country whose lives will be more secure because of this law and the Supreme Court's decision to uphold it. When you talk about that decision to uphold it and what's changing on the court, on the substance, that's part of what the court will lose with Breyer retiring. And the question is, who will replace him? And would they have similar views about federal power and health care as we go through this pandemic? Breyer was also on the losing side of certain issues in a left of center minority. There was a 2004 ruling on partisan gerrymandering, something that so many people have talked about, Rachel, on our air for years, how this can undermine democracy. The court basically didn't want to get super involved, and Breyer disagreed, saying democracy was at stake and that purely political gerrymandering can fail to advance any plausible democratic objective and threaten serious democratic harm. Like Ginsburg and Scalia on other issues, that was how he would advocate, writing not only for the day, but for history to perhaps turn that dissent into a majority. Now, Breyer was in the majority on other voting cases. He wrote a closely divided opinion on the winning side, five to four, stopping Alabama from what would basically dilute the lawful power of black voters in the state. Now, going back to the interview we did just about two years ago, I asked him something that I actually wonder about as someone who's studied the law and reports on the law, which is how do you do these rulings where politics is the whole story and you know it's going to benefit a political side no matter what you do? How do you stay above that political fray ruling in these kind of cases? We stay out of politics. 
And really, sometimes it's very hard to just stay out. But the more the political fray is uh, hot and intense and so forth, the more it's we stay out of it. And of course, we have to stay out of it because the decisions we're making are decisions for 330 million Americans. Fact check true. The justices are some of the least scrutinized and least covered members of the federal government. We don't even get cameras in their courtrooms, even though that's how a lot of people learn about what's happening in the world or videos that you take in a courtroom and put on the Internet. Either way, that's not even allowed. And yet it's not just 330 million Americans governed by things like the health care ruling. It's also life and death. We are a country rare among civilized democracies that still executes our own citizens. And the death penalty, as I've reported repeatedly on this program, has proven to be biased against poor people and black and brown people. I could tell you Justice Breyer was someone who clearly cared about that. And he was losing these cases, meaning he was writing in the minority in those dissents about exactly what's wrong, he said, with the American death penalty. In 2015, he wrote that it likely constitutes a legally prohibited, cruel and unusual punishment. This was a jurist who, whatever else you thought of him, cared deeply about that obligation. All those appeals that go up to the Supreme Court where people would say, not only was this case wrong or a miscarriage of justice or someone might be innocent, but someone might be innocent and about to be executed in our name by our government. Now, when you get back to where we're headed, of course, like any reporter, nothing special about this question, you got to ask a justice, especially as they get on in years, about their thoughts on potential successors. This was an area where he clearly demurred. That is a political process insofar as nominating and confirming the judge is concerned. And so asking me about that process, it's like asking for the recipe for chicken a la king from the point of view of the chicken. Now, just like for TV hosts, it's a lower bar for uh, humor from Supreme Court justices. That's his bon mot that he sees himself as like the chicken. Don't ask me the chicken about the recipe. Go talk to the chef. Well, that's really where we are. These are people, these nine justices who, yield, who wield such huge powers. And the question is, any time you have one of these vacancies, who should have that lifetime appointment? Remember, nobody else has a lifetime appointment in the other branches, Congress, Senate, President, of course. Who should get the lifetime power? And what do we want to do on that process? So we think about what Breyer did, but also where we're headed. And as part of our special coverage, I can tell you I'm going to fit in a quick break. And next, we have an acclaimed Supreme Court reporter and a Briarologist. Stay with us.